Jesus is king. One of the most important questions you can ask for yourselves every day is, who is king? Who is king of your life? Now, uh, these two guys, one probably doesn't need an introduction right now, and the other maybe does. Uh, this is, of course, Vladimir Putin. And on the other side is the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, Patriarch Kirill of Moscow. And it's very interesting to think of who is king because as Russia launches this illegal and unjust war against its neighbors. It's neighbors that essentially have the same faith as them. They're all part of the Orthodox Church. In fact, there was a thing where the Ukrainians, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church actually used to be under this guy, and they broke away a couple of years ago because they weren't very happy with being under a guy who was, well, I can just tell you this, that in all of this terrible war, this person has said nothing about what Vladimir Putin has done. And there's a very simple reason why he hasn't come out and, you know, at least had a tweet like, you know, hey, maybe we should stop cluster bombing people. The reason why is he is there in his position because Vladimir Putin put him in that position. Ultimately, Jesus is not his king. A man is. And when man is your king, the results, no matter how expedient in the moment, in the end, will be extraordinarily ugly. When man is king, the results are ugly. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray that you would move in our hearts today. Show us who is king. And if it is not Jesus, I pray, Lord God, that you would make it so. Make it so day by day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. This is going to be a sermon. I'm going to give you the whole outline before we start so you can... You know, if you are someone who likes to fall asleep, you can just learn this really, really well. The rest of the stuff is just exposition. Okay. Jesus is king. In that one, in this text, he displays his kingly authority amazingly. Secondly, true disciples recognize that authority and give him ultimate praise. And third, rebels to his rule will suffer his judgment. So who is king? Jesus is king. All right, we're going to get to this whole story. Luke 19, verse 28. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead. And if we remember back, the last thing he just said, the parable of the Minas, and it ended with, as for those people who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here before me and slaughter them. So there's a, there's a little ominous tone here. As he said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And this movement that we've seen in the book of Luke, the whole geography thing, we started out 952, we set his face toward Jerusalem, and he has been going on, and now the time has arrived at this very text Jesus is going to enter into Jerusalem now by the way if you're wondering like how long is the preacher going to be preaching on Luke it's at least six more months I counted it out last week I know like we're in Jerusalem and yet there is there is six months of sermons left and that's if I preach every week okay when he drew near and highlight that word draw near we're going to hear it again because this is tension building to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet he sent two of the disciples and we can imagine we're traveling east on the Jericho road Jericho being about 18 miles which is where we met Zacchaeus now we're going east on that road and as we go there the last big ridge it's kind of a ridge they call it a mountain but it's really a ridge 
the Mount of Olives or Olivet. On the back side of that, before we get to Jerusalem, is Bethany and Bethphage. And they're about two miles from Jerusalem. And here he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has, et- has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. First, let's just recognize in this text, Jesus, again, like he knows things, like he knows that this, uh, it's, it's a colt. It's actually a donkey we know from the other Gospels. And secondly, doesn't it seem kind of weird that he's going to send two of his disciples to go steal someone's donkey? I'm like, well, what's with that? Jesus is like going like straight up jacking this donkey. Like this is not, okay. So this, this, all, this all makes sense. I had to study along. I, I read a journal article this week. And man, you're like reading journal articles from 1970. Like it gets pretty deep. But anyways, there is this thing called, uh, it, it is called Angaria. And it is where important people could requisition mounts. And this was used all the time by, you know, by the Roman officials. As you can imagine, people did not like this very much. Where they could take for the postal system or for thing, they could take an animal and then use it for a while and then send it back. And we even see this kind of like requisition in the Bible. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them too. And so this, whole, you know, forcing people, Simon had to carry the cross. Romans say, oh, you carry it. And, you know, so they, the king tells you what to do and you do it. And it's, the details are even really cool here because it says, so it's like, why does he say untie it and bring it here? You think that would be kind of like, you know, obviously you're going to untie it. But the untying is really important. Because if you go and you untie this donkey, if you're the one who unties it, it makes you 100% liable for the safety of the animal. If the animal like has a heart attack and falls down, like after it takes one step after you untie it, you have to replace the whole animal by, by the law. Now, if the owner unties it, then it's like you're in business together and then you, you might not have to replace the whole thing. And so the entire, Jesus is doing the person a favor here. Now he also sends two of his disciples because they're going to ask a question. You need two people in order to witness properly to what Jesus said. So all of these details are important. They seem weird to us. But the really key thing is the Lord has need of it. And Lord here, Lord can, can not mean a whole, whole bunch. It can mean just, you know, someone who's important. And yet, in this case, so one of the people who could request like a mount from a person in a village to ride were rabbis. And rabbis would often use this. And rabbi would often, they would say, the master, that's how they would call a rabbi. The rabbi has need of it. But he doesn't say the rabbi has need of it because it's the Lord who has need of it. Because this is not just going to be a normal requisitioning. This is going to be a kingly mount. In fact, I, I think this verse should be translated. And it's, it's a little awkward in English, so they don't do it this way. It's probably the most, the simplest way to read this isn't the Lord has need of it, but its Lord has need. And Jesus declared, like, he is the Lord of this because ultimately we're going to see he's the messianic king of David who has a right, who has a right to borrow what he needs. Jesus is king. So those who were sent away, had, so those who were sent away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, Its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? Logical thing to say. And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they recognized like someone who is important, the Lord needs this. Maybe even the Messianic king, which there's going to be a lot of excitement about. There's this really cool interplay. The word Lord here and owners in Greek is actually the same word. Depending on context, we mean different things. And so it's the Lord of the cult 
They're like, what do we need this? But the Lord of everything says, I need it. And Jesus is showing his lordship over all things. Now, the next question he asks, why a, why a colt? Why a donkey here? And this goes into fulfilling biblical prophecy. Zechariah 9.9 Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so Jesus is preparing his specifically prepared kingly mount from years before foretold to ride over the Mount Olivet into his city, the crowning achievement so far of his ministry. I always love the fact here it says, humble and mounted on a donkey. Just showing Jesus' humility. Like it's, it's, it's so crazy, like, I can get, like, prideful and arrogant by beating my eight-year-old child in a board game. <laughs> it's like, yes, I want a Candyland again. <laughs> I'm very competitive. <sighs> Jesus can be king of everything on his royal mount riding in, and he's still humble and we're going to see some amazing evidence of that as we go through this text. Jesus is the humble king. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. This is a cool picture because it's not, they don't just like, like have Jesus get up on it. Like, they pick him up and they like put him on it like he is, he is the king. <laughs> And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was, oh, there's a word again, drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives. And can you picture that? This is the moment we've been waiting for for so long. As Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem and went through Galilee and then southern Judea, then down to Jericho, on the Jericho road, step by step. And you remember that, I don't know whoever like moved to Fort Capel, but I moved to Fort Capel. And that moment I first came out, I'm driving along and it's just nothing but prairie. There's nothing but prairie all the way from Winnipeg, all the way to here. Like it's just five hours of a vast pit of nothingness. And all of a sudden, I'm driving along Highway 10, and all of a sudden, I get over the ridge, and boom, the valley opens up before me, and it's this whole thing, and I just see it all at once. And you can imagine this right now, as they go over, this is the last ridge. Mount Olivet. And as soon as they get over the top, before you spreads out the city of David. Jerusalem, and the time long foretold has finally come where the king long foretold mounted on a donkey riding down into the city, his city. They're laying cloaks on the ground, showing the holiness of the rider because then as now there are, there are actually like hundreds of thousands of graves on, on Mount uh, on the Mount of Olives. And the reason for this is it's foretold a little later in Zechariah that this is where the Lord will stand on the last day. So when Jesus appears, it's probably going to be there, like that spot where he is right now in this story when he comes back to judge the quick and the dead. And because there's so many graves, it's like, because there's holiness, you need separation for that. That's why they put them on the horse or on the, on the donkey. They lay their cloaks on the ground to show the holiness of the rider. And now the time has come. Will Jerusalem be ready for their king? Oh, as they do this, the whole multitude of his disciples begins to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works, the miracles that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. 
And they quote this messianic psalm. And the messianic psalm, they almost quote it word for word, except they add two words. You know what those two words are? Let me guess. It's highlighted. The king. <laughs> Not just blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king, humble, mounted on the donkey. The significance of this event is not lost in any one of his disciples. Now they might be really thinking, you know, they're coming in to kick the Romans out and have a rule. They, they weren't reading, you know, they weren't paying attention when, you know, in the parable before when Jesus talked about, you know, they supposed the kingdom would appear immediately. Now, secondly, the cool thing in here is that we remember way back, and this is the part of Luke we probably know the best, Luke 2. And at Jesus' birth, we remember the angel's song. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among, tho among those whom he is pleased. And now his disciples have joined in the eternal song of the angels, giving glory to Jesus Christ, the King, as he rides into his town. So, tracking so far, we've done Jesus is the King. He shows his authority and all the things that he do. And now we see his true disciples recognize his authority as king, and give themselves in joyful praise. But not everyone would praise. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, by the way, everybody else calling him king, everyone else calling him Lord, I said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Probably the stones of the road they're going upon. Now the Pharisees were not unaware of what was going on. They recognized the Psalms. They recognized everyone is treating him like a king. But some people are a little worried because there's another king out there that they don't want to offend Tiberius Caesar Augustus and his appointed governor Pilate. And I don't know what day may come when we are asked to decide between our allegiance towards an earthly king and the king. I mean, there's, you know, I think, of, I, I think of the poor conscript in the Russian army now. You know, being asked to fight in a war he really probably doesn't care about. What did he do? Days like that, you have to ask yourself, who is king? And be prepared to do the hardest things. Because your king, your king is whom you're going to serve. So they asked him to quiet his disciples. And Jesus said, if he won't be praised by men, the very stones will praise him. Something that no earthly king has ever gotten. That Jesus is more than just a king. And when he, oh, there's that word again, drew near. Oh, we're building tension. And saw the city, he wept over it, saying, would that you have even known, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. You know who makes for peace? Following the Prince of Peace, King Jesus. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. Now this refers quite directly to the events of the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 under the Roman military general when the entire city was surrounded, burned, 
and destroyed right to its very roots. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation, referring to the time when God came among them in Jesus Christ. Now, as we read this, these last sentences, it all harkens back to the last line in the parable of the meanest just before. As for these enemies of mine that who do not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Jesus is the wonderful counselor, the prince of peace, the mighty God, and yet so many reject his rule. They don't want Jesus Christ in the gospel because it insults their pride. Like, I'm, I'm a good person on my own. Like, why do I need this guy? They don't want Jesus because he's inconvenient for their lifestyle. Like, I don't want to be like having to like spend my Sunday morning somewhere. Maybe I don't want to, you know, I don't want to have to, you know, you know, one man, one woman for life. Like, that's a pretty hard deal for some people. Or maybe... They just don't know the true Jesus. They don't know his grace, his goodness, his heart. Because it's so interesting here, and, and we read the end of, end of the parable of the minus, and it sounds kind of harsh to us. Like, you know, these people who reject Jesus, they're getting what they deserve. Like they rejected their king. But even as Jesus goes there, even as he knows what is coming as he rides down the Mount of Olives, looking down upon the city. He knows what awaits him there. The mock trial being spat upon, beaten, crucified, died. And yet, for all of those people, as he looks down upon the city, he does not weep for himself. He weeps for them. Seeing how lost they are, having a heart of compassion. And this is the Jesus Christ who, yes, is the king and he is a judge, but he has a heart of compassion that is so amazing for those who would be his enemies. And this is a still for you today. If you have turned away from Jesus Christ if you have ignored him like the people who are not welcoming him, if you have mocked him like the Pharisees, he still wants, he still wants you to turn to him, to bow the knee before it's too late, to acknowledge his rightful rule. Who is king? Now it's pretty easy when we look about on other people's decisions and say, well, huh, you know, what a foolish guy. He won't say anything against Vladimir Putin, who's so obviously evil. In this picture, like Caesar is Lord in this picture and it's so ugly. You know, an interesting fact, you know, thinking of Caesar as Lord, there's uh, Putin, actually, if you, if you, he thinks of himself a lot of his, his, he thinks of himself as one of the great Russian leaders like Catherine the Great. He thinks of himself as a czar of Russia in many ways, a czar. And you know what the word czar means? It comes from an old word, czar, Caesar, Caesar. It comes from Caesar. He thinks of himself as Caesar, and to those who submit to Caesar, ugly things come. And yet, even as we see it so easily in others, we need to look in the mirror. In our own lives, day by day, who is king? And the way to, the way to know this, like, how do I know what is king? You have to ask yourself, what is the final authority in my life? 
Is the final authority God's word in Jesus Christ? Or is the final authority what I want at a particular moment or some human leader or philosophy or science? Who is king in your life? Is he ruling your heart? Do you excitedly worship him like his disciples? Or do you tepidly go your way, only giving lip service? Because one person will rule in your heart, be it Jesus Christ, or be it yourself, or be it some other man or philosophy. And if it's anything less than the Prince of Peace, you will never, ever have peace and in the end fall under God's judgment. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for your faithfulness. I pray, Lord God, that we would see you more and more. Our eyes would be open to you and your kingship. We pray that we would just see your faithfulness in all things. Pray, Lord God, for each one of the people here that you would be their king. In Jesus' name. Amen.